Hello, my name is Dr. Jared Kilmer. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and the director of counseling services for Game to Grow. I'm excited to introduce our symposia, Rolling for Recovery, Therapeutic Applications of Tabletop Role-Playing Games. Individuals struggling with mental health concerns are often impacted by decreased engagement, functioning, and a sense of ability and or agency to solve their problems. Tabletop role-playing games, like Dungeons and Dragons, are interactive, semi-structured storytelling experiences where group members work cooperatively to solve problems and overcome narrative obstacles. Tabletop role-playing games have been applied to therapeutic environments to help address mental health challenges by utilizing vicarious scenarios to prompt participants to develop and practice problem-solving skills, frustration tolerance, interpersonal effectiveness, and empathy. Doctors Battles and Quinlan will discuss the implementation of a therapeutically applied role-playing game group with veterans at a VA medical center. Then we'll hear from Dr. Kilmer and Mr. Davis as they introduce the Game to Grow method of therapeutically applied role-playing games and provide outcome data from participants of therapeutic social skills groups for youth. Finally, Dr. Connell will discuss her work with applied gaming groups for female identified individuals and non-binary individuals. And Dr. Kelly will discuss his work implementing therapeutically applied role-playing games with neurodivergent youth. The slides for the presentation will be available at www.gametogrow.org slash APA. That's game, T-O, grow.org. We'll also be hosting a 30-minute office hours on Friday, August 13th at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific, and we hope to see you there. Without further ado, I'd like to pass the screen off to our first presenters, Drs. Battles and Quinlan. Hello, I am Dr. Thomas Quinlan, a psychologist at the Minneapolis VA. And I am Dr. Allison Battles, psychology postdoctoral fellow at the Minneapolis VA. And we're, gonna, we're here today to talk to you about a, a group that we've been running called Role for Growth. So this, um, our talk is going to be a program evaluation of kind of a preliminary study that we've been doing, um, looking at tabletop role-playing games with veterans. So a little bit of an introduction. Play is a free activity that's standing quite consistently outside of ordinary life is being not serious, but at the same time absorbing the player intensely and utterly. This concept of play is something that we really want to be highlighting and talking about. Because within play, there are numerous characteristics. The idea that its play is self-chosen and self-directed, it's intrinsically motivated, guided by mental rules, but the rules leave some room for creativity. It's imaginative, it's conducted in an alert, active, but non-relatively stressed frame of mind. The reason that we're kind of highlighting these things when it comes to specifically looking at gaming is because we wanna look at kind of what happens with the development of role of play. So developmental psychology has talked a lot about this. So everything from the adaptive functions of play. Uh, in developmental psychology, there's been a positive function of play. It's been a running theme for some of the most respected scholars in our field when it comes to developmental. Everybody from Erickson to Piaget to Vygotsky, they really talk about what the context of play is. And for us, this is kind of the, you know, the broad fundamentals of play is really what shapes gaming and why this is so important for us to be talking about. It allows us to explore the social norms and roles, simulating new learning. It also is a way to kind of practice or facilitate connection and cooperation. The idea is that you, the benefits don't leave even after you grow up and leave Neverland. Um, play can really allow for a sense of connectedness and it's an experiential practice of agency. It's really when we kind of talk about this and this is gonna be a big focus for why we're doing what we're doing is Play is a safer place for people to maybe experiment and to try things that they've been wanting to do when it comes to their social life. So first, some myths about gaming. And we're talking about gaming, we're gonna be specifically talking for our talk about tabletop gaming. We're gonna be specifically be talking about uh, role playing. Now, these myths really encompass kind of the full spectrum of gaming. And this could be everything from card games to board games to tabletop role playing to video games. But one of the biggest myths that we'll start with is that games are just for kids. Um, a, a 2019 Pew study found that about 40% of gamers are ages 18 to 35. And on top of that, something that is really important is th this ranges because 21% are 50 and older. And this is really to recognize that 
games could be anything from playing solitaire to playing cribbage to playing games on the phone. But that idea that games are just for kids is something that just is, is much more of a myth. Um, the other myth is only men play games. Recent surveys show that women account for 46% of gamers, and that number has been increasing. This is something that I think ties into the fact of what gaming culture can look like, and one of the things that we're really trying to fight when we talk about stigma. Um, women are less likely to identify as gamers, um, and a lot of times this is due to harassment and really prejudice and discrimination that can occur to women. There's even research showing that women are more likely to play as male characters in multiplayer games online where they are able to do that. And they will do that just to kind of uh, not have to, to, to have that separation to not face this. But in reality, a large percentage of our gamers are women. Uh, the biggest myth, video games make people antisocial and more violent. Uh, APA has had a task force and they've actually looked at this and while there has been a consistent pattern found of aggressive behavior that can occur from violent video games, there is not good evidence that this predicts violent behavior or outcomes outside of kind of the, the um, experimental condition. It could be one factor, but the, it is, if it was, violence is something that is such a multifactorial thing that video games account for such a small portion. The, the, also, the fact is that a lot of games have a social component to them. They promote social interactions and social skill utilization. One thing that we're going to talk about today is our goal, our, our group specifically was even aimed at trying to capitalize on some of those social skills. And then finally, the idea that games are intellectually lazy and sedating. That idea that people just sit around and mindlessly play video games. Um, playing games has been shown to have promote a wide variety of cognitive skills and are shown to improve processing speed, working memory, attention, visual spatial reasoning, retention, recall, and recognition. So for us, we're looking at the analog game research. This means that we are specifically looking at the tabletop role playing. Tabletop role playing are really associated with improved empathy, cognitive flexibility, experiential engagement, and quality of life. This quality of life is something that is very important for us for what we were looking for targeting outside of just symptoms. It's a simulative environment which allows players to experiment with new interpersonal interactions and to kind of confront socially related fears. We often say that tabletop gaming allows for basically, you can do anything. It doesn't mean that there won't be consequences and that really is a topic that has come up a lot for us. It also allows us to explore both the seen and the unseen parts of ourself. We develop a greater sense of confidence with expressing less visible aspects and gain insight into the perspectives and reactions of others. So the group that uh, Dr. Quinlan and I developed at the Minneapolis VA is called the Role for Growth Group. And we will present on some of our um, findings from our um, preliminary program evaluation, particularly looking at the feasibility and acceptability of this group. So this group um, was a new group therapy at the Minneapolis VA utilizing therapeutically applied tabletop role-playing games, TARPGs as we like to call them. And specifically our group focused on using the tabletop role-playing game Dungeons and Dragons. So as a little bit of an introduction of how uh, tabletop role-playing games operate, most um, how things will tend to roll in the, in the game is care, um, players will come into the game space and they will interact with this imagined narrative environment that is oftentimes narrated by the game master or the dungeon master, who is the narrator, the mechanics operator, the one that kind of focuses on how the game runs and getting players through the different different types of narrative content. Players themselves are interacting with this game environment as a character. So they are creating this, this different person for them to be able to play out within the game space. And then they are verbalizing and articulating what their character would like to do. There is also a randomization element that is tossed into the game in the use of die rolls. So with those dice rolls coupled with uh, player narration, the world and the story of this environment will start to unfold and take place and players will be able to choose what their characters do within that game environment. Now it's also important to highlight that these types of games are also you know, intensely collaborative. Oftentimes players will be coming into the game space and they will work together with 
a adventuring party. So a, a band of adventurers that are setting out together in search of, you know, fill in the blank of whatever your campaign includes. So this is what our, our group was being able to utilize was this foundation of the tabletop role-playing game space in which we then integrated in evidence-based practices uh, in addition to established TARPG techniques. So our group specifically um, was a um, cohort-based group where we um, the group was run for 12 weeks with two-hour virtual group sessions. The group was originally designed to meet in person, but due to COVID-related restrictions, <laughs> moved it to this online virtual space. 90 minutes of that group is spent in gameplay itself, and then 30 minutes at the end of group is spent on post-game processing. Now, as I mentioned, this is an integrative approach, one in which we kind of in utilize evidence-based practices as well as some established techniques for TARPGs. And in our program evaluation, we will present on data from three cohorts of six veterans. Next slide. So getting into some of the therapeutic components, our group specifically integrated in uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, cognitive behavioral social skills training, uh, as well as interpersonal process as our evidence-based approaches into this narrative and therapeutic game space. Uh, in addition to that, we also utilize principles from narrative therapy, as well as integrated in techniques from uh, established TARPG um, approaches. More specifically, we utilized um, techniques from the game to grow method, uh, and, you, and we're able to kind of integrate those and adapt those to be able to uh, match our kind of VA specific approach. Now, I want to acknowledge that TARPGs do not inherently align with one therapeutic approach. So this is one where uh, Dr. Quinlan and I were able to kind of integrate evidence-based practices that we were already uh, skilled and competent in and be able to integrate them into this uh, game space with the game space allowing itself to be more of the foundation from which uh, group members participated. And then we we were able to overlay those therapeutic techniques, therapeutic principles uh, into this narrative environment. And I think this is one area that we really kind of use, as the, you can see on the screen, talking about everything from uh, emotional regulation to perspective taking to pretend play. We were really trying to highlight kind of this within the game and within the process. So we kind of talk about the fact that therapy and the therapeutic components do not take place just in that 30 minutes of post-game process. They are going on throughout the, the, the throughout the hour and a half that we had of gameplay. We would even interrupt and kind of check in with people to talk about things if we noticed that it was important. Another element that we added that really I think really improved things as we kind of were going because we were constantly we were refining as we were going through this was adding in kind of a, a almost like an icebreaker question that you know similar to what we would do in a psychosocial rehabilitation and recovery center within the VA um, where there's community meetings. We wanted people to really focus on getting into character before they started play. And we would scale these based on what happened the week before. That's one of the things that's nice about the flexibility is we can really kind of adapt and adjust. And so we would ask them a question to try to see what would your character do? What would your character want to do in this situation to try to get them into that role? Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, it was also one where group members would come in and complete a pre and post group interview. And so it's one where even before the group got started, we were able to get a sense of what were each group members goals, what were their presenting concerns. And that allowed us to be able to tailor this narrative environment in order to integrate in encounters that allowed for those opportunities for therapeutic growth. For example, if a group member finds themselves really struggling with initiating conversation. They may find themselves as their character in a situation where they need to ask uh, a shopkeep for a specific item. And so the, the narrative environment is one in which the character is then having to ask, you know, a, a non-player character in that interaction. But it is also one that is stimulating them to be able to utilize social skills of initiating communication. This may be a moment where, depending upon group levels, um, the group's need, the group's understanding, 
understanding. We may kind of pause to talk about, you know, what, how would one go about integrating in, or initiating a conversation, especially from that CBSST model. Um, but other times it may be one where group members may have that knowledge, but it's more allowing them to develop that confidence, that skill building within the practice components of the gameplay. And there's one thing that Dr. Uh, Battle said, we did this pre-group interview. So on the screen right now, you can see we're just briefly showing what the measures are. So we're highlighting kind of what we were looking at. As you can see, it does hit the gamut of social anxiety to self-perception to strengths and difficulties. This is really a recovery-based model in some ways. And we talk about that integrative approach that really wanted to look at kind of quality of life and not just necessarily symptoms, mm -hmm. but also what people are doing because the goal was that they would take these skills and apply them. Very much so. So our, and our participants, our sample. Yes. And so while our predominant, so our predominant uh, referral, um, you know, kind of target was social skills, interpersonal functioning, but we also ended up having uh, veterans participate in the group from a kind of across the gamut of diagnostic presenting concerns, as well as uh, cultural identities and backgrounds. In our completed samples, we had a total of uh, 11 uh, individuals complete the group out of the 18 that were originally enrolled. Um, on average, age was around 38 years with a pretty big span in terms of age range in terms of people who were getting involved. Um, in addition to that, particularly regarding diagnostics, I list, we list out here kind of specific diagnoses, but one thing we want to note is that 10 out of the 18 people who were referred to us and enrolled in the group had high levels of comorbidity with PTSD and ma uh, major depression being the two most commonly co common and co-occurring conditions um, in our group experience. Next slide. So in terms of the outcomes in uh, the feasibility and acceptability portion of this uh, pro uh, program evaluation, of those that participated, 61% successfully completed the group. Um, and this is actually a number that is um, you know, on average, you know, in line with a lot of other VA groups, is actually a little higher than some VA groups in the sense that the VA tends to have a bit of a higher dropout in terms of group participation. So we were thrilled to be able to see a 61% complete rate and we're also able to glean a lot of information from participants about why folks some folks stayed versus some folks didn't with the most commonly occurring reason for folks discontinuing the group was um, lack of perceived fit with the group uh, some folks kind of stepped into that narrative gameplay space and were like you know what this is not exactly what I was anticipating I don't think it's going to work for me and so those were some folks that ended up discontinuing the group whereas the other most commonly occurring reason was the need for escalation of care um, now, of those that did, uh, you know, um, complete the group, when folks were engaged, they were engaged with, on average, folks completing 11 out of the 12 sessions. Um, client satisfaction was also very, very high with a mean score of 57.1 out of 63. And this was on an adapted CSQ that we utilized for our group experience that got a bit more specific into kind of the details, the nuances of the group and how that that was impacting diff different degrees of satisfaction. Now, folks identified that the most helpful parts of the group were post-game processing, uh, sense of connection with other group members, but also that feedback process that came up in the group, not only in the gameplay components where characters or even players were able to provide their real-time responses to how other group members were interacting, but also in um, that post-game um, part um, component where they're able to then get a little bit deeper into how uh, that game experience may mirror aspects of their personal life and how they can then learn to translate some of the things that were going on in group into skills and abilities in their own personal life. Next slide. So in addition to the feasibility and acceptability, we also did look at some pilot outcomes, specifically wanting to see if there were indeed any changes on the pre and post group measures that we administered. And we're thrilled to say that indeed there was. So we found that there was a significant mean reduction in total depression symptoms, total generalized anxiety symptoms, uh, anger and aggression, as well as social avoidance. And in particular for depression and generalized anxiety ended up 
finding that these were large effect sizes and where folks were noticing um, pre and post group differences. In addition to those mean reductions, we also saw a significant mean increase and in, um, degree of pro-social behavior. So really giving some evidence that participation in the group may be impacting, um, you know, kind of folks in, um, decreasing their degree of avoidance and starting to re-engage in more pro-social behaviors or behaviors that felt really healthy or helpful for them. And in addition to that, the skills or areas that folks identified having the most benefit were social skills skills, which was our primary target of the group. So we were so thrilled to be able to see that. But folks also identified that other areas of benefit were in areas of um, personal awareness, as well as trust. And we found that trust one to be really big, especially as we're talking about a VA, a veteran population where challenges with trust are oftentimes a very common occurring uh, experience among veterans. So that was a really exciting finding to be able to, to see. Next slide. Now, in addition to the um, you know, quantitative data that we ca um, um, captured, we also collected some qualitative reportings, both in the sense of pre and post group interviews, um, but as well as some aspects of um, you know, how folks were reporting in kind of uh, fill in, you know, free text boxes within the post group survey. Now, um, could go through a lot of the different data, but I think one of the best ways to really reflect some of the experiences in group is actually a bit of a story. So in our very first cohort, we had one group member who he came in identifying that he struggles with frustration tolerance. So this was a, a goal of this veterans across our group experience and was something that he had worked on to varying degrees. We reached this dungeon in which, you know, the, the party was heading down in there to kind of take out this, this final big bad and save the king kingdom, but not without some puzzles tossed into the dungeon. So the party, you know, descends a long flight of stairs, entering into this, this uh, stone chamber. And all across the chamber are statues of cats, cats of various shapes, various sizes, various materials, colors. Um, but in addition to this cat filled room, they also find that on the very back of the wall, on the ground is a large stone box. And behind that box on the wall, uh, you know, carved into it, reads how many cats does it take to fill an empty box? So naturally a riddle, a riddle with a physical component. And I do have to give, uh, give some props to Dr. Elizabeth Kilmer for inspiration and things for this puzzle in particular. Um, and so the group kind of set forth with trying to figure that out, looked into the box. Initially, there were like three cats in the box. So this one group member who was uh, working more on frustration tolerance, he kind of single-mindedly set forth to you know figure out this puzzle. So he was taking cats out, he was putting cats in, he was trying cats of different, you know, cats categories, um, while other group members were also giving suggestions, but suggestions that didn't seem to be sinking in or taking into the veteran as they weren't really impacting how he was approaching this this puzzle. So uh, you know, fast forward several minutes, still trying to figure out this puzzle, nothing really seems to be working. And in game, we are seeing this character's frustration just escalate higher and higher and higher until the character reaches a point of just throwing up his hands and being like, I'm just going to smash this box with my axe. And he was like, and the, um, the player themselves paused after he said that. He was like, whoa, I'm doing it again. I'm, I'm just like running headlong into a problem without like taking a step back. I'm doing it again. My, my frustration's getting away from me. And so this group member, we were able to have a moment of pausing in the game for this group member to take that step back to really be able to kind of see how was he responding to his character and how is the character responding to that situation. And in turn, the character's response impacting him as the player and his response. And so with that pause, other group members were able to step in to give the veteran feedback to really kind of indicate if like, you know, yeah, I really want to help you, but you were just kind of running headlong, I felt like I really couldn't get a word in edgewise. And so they were able to have this dialogue of what was going on and then step back into that gameplay in more of that collaborative space to finally solve this problem. And interestingly, another group member actually gave the solution to this puzzle at the very, very beginning of, well, if there's any cats in a box, then it's no longer empty. So the solution to this puzzle was empty the box. And they did that and were able to you know, kind of successfully go on through the rest of the dungeon. 
And I think this really highlights too the nature of how you can use something like tabletop role playing and the importance of having the game master and the flexibility that we have within the game. There, I mean, there's there's a lot of ways to bring people together. There's combat and there's riddle. This group was very good at combat. You know, they had, and, and most of our groups were, and we would even use that early on as a way to maybe try to bond the group, especially with those trusts. There's ways to capitalize on things. We have a veteran population that kind of understood organization when it came to something like a battle or mm -hmm. something like a dungeon where they're being attacked. Puzzles or riddles is a very different skill set. We had some groups that, yeah, they would do fine with them. And so we were able to tailor where we aimed because we wanted to really bring out that uh, that theory of mind to really kind of blur that line and let them understand that difference between character and not character. This veteran was somebody who very clearly had said too, there were times within games, he was trying to do things that he how he would want to do them in his real life because he would get so frustrated, but he knew that he couldn't do them in his real life. So he would try it in the game. And what was happening is he would get similar responses. It wasn't working in game either. But it was a place for him to kind of say, like, wow, I tried that out here and it still didn't go well. Like, maybe I need to make a change. Mm -hmm. um, the last bit of qualitative that I think is very important, you know, looking at this word cloud and just looking at uh, just kind of all of the stuff that came up with social skills, communication, self-awareness, willingness. One data point that we had is two of our cohorts exchanged information to kind of keep this game going or to kind of play in a different way because we had people with different levels of experience. And I really think that that speaks to the fact of we were a closed cohort. 12 weeks, we had a lot of people saying like, that, this campaign's ending, I, d I, I don't want to. And mm -hmm. we, you know, we kind of really highlighted like, here's resources for maybe finding a group in your area or the group themselves finding that. Mm -hmm. And especially as we think about just general, you know, cost of healthcare and cost there of services, one of the things we're also trying to foster, not only in the VA, but as mental health providers, is that sense of empowerment, that sense of agency to be able to kind of go forth and utilize these skills and coping resources and abilities in people's personal lives. So we were really found it encouraging that alumni groups were, you know, occurred in two out of our three groups to be able to go on and to continue continue to have this play experience together. And we think that is a huge benefit of this group to be able to foster that connectedness, that social support, but also potentially, and we don't have data to speak to this, but hopefully one day we will, of whether or not we're seeing folks potentially use ser services less after participating in the group. Because especially as we think about more of that recovery oriented standpoint, any way that we are able to kind of foster that agency, that depend, you know, that, um, you know, that independence can be really great for one's recovery journey and especially if that is a sense of empowerment that is also coupled with a stable social support network so thank you all for tuning in to our talk and we'll pass it off to the next folks My name is Adam Davis. I have a master's in education with a specialization in drama therapy. I'm a founder and executive director of game to grow and I've been using tabletop role-playing games and therapeutic social skills groups for more than a decade. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Kilmer. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and the director of education and training for game to grow I've developed and run therapeutically applied role-playing game groups with ages 8 through 86 across VA, community health, and private practice settings. Doctors Battles and Quinlan have given a great introduction into the justification and the theoretical underpinnings of therapeutically applied role-playing games. Now, we'll give you more insight into what a tabletop role-playing game is, how we use them in our therapeutic social skills groups for youth, as well as some outcome data that looks at expectations and experiences for participants and youth. In therapeutically applied role-playing game, uh, gameplay is synthesized with established therapeutic techniques to catalyze the inherent benefits of role-playing games. The Game to Grow method pulls some of its theoretical foundation from ACT, drama therapy, and narrative therapy. And within the Game to Grow method, there are two primary types of TARPG groups. There's counseling groups with a formal processing component, and the therapeutic social skills groups, which have a primary focus on building social confidence and flourishing socially um, for participants on their own terms. Uh, this method is designed to be adaptable and has been implemented in mental health, community, and education settings. And as has already been alluded to, the Game to Grow method is appropriate for use uh, with children, adolescents, and adults. And now to better understand what a tabletop role-playing game is, it may also help to know what it is not. Unlike a lot of games, tabletop role-playing games don't have players working against each other. In the tabletop role-playing game, the players are collaborating, working together. And in a lot of games, 
players are working uh, to achieve points or have some sort of arbitrary win condition. And in a tabletop role-playing game, the characters that the players are playing in their in their role-playing game are actually working together to tell a story. So the outcomes associated with this kind of experience are creating an interesting story where the characters that the players have created are actually triumphing and overcoming obstacles that they are creating together. So the um, most unique thing about a tabletop role-playing game is the unique role of the game master. Now, the cycle of play in a tabletop role-playing game has the game master describing the situation that the characters are in. The game master will describe the situation often involving an obstacle between the, the, the characters that the players are playing and something that they want. And now the players will listen to that description from the game master, just determine what their characters are going to do to overcome that obstacle, oftentimes discussing amongst themselves how they're going to collaborate to do so, then they'll tell the game master how their characters are going to respond. The game master then listens to that, determines if any use of a randomizing agent would be appropriate, and then uh, describes the appropriate result. And I'll give you an example of what this might look like. Uh, in, in a game that I ran, I had a group of, of players and their characters had gone into a town. And this town had uh, some security measures involved. So when their characters went into town, they had to put their weapons into a secretly magical locked chest for the safety of the entire town, of course. Now, when the characters got into town, they were exploring and investigating, learning some more about the history of this town. And over dinner, as their characters sat around and getting to know each other a little bit better, some skeletons suddenly burst through the floor and through the walls and started attacking the people in town. And I said to the players, what do you do next? And one of my players held up his hands like this, clenched his fists and said, I summon my weapons to myself. And he had designed his character with magical runic tattoos along the inside of his forearms, such that at, at his very command, his weapons would appear back in his own arms. And my player was looking at his, his, his uh, forearms as if there were runic tattoos in, uh, tattooed right there on his own arms. But naturally his weapons were sealed in a magical chest. So I said, your weapons don't show up. Your weapons are locked in that magical chest and they don't show up. And at this moment, this player clenched his fists and he, began to have a shortness of breath and he clenched his jaw. And he said, this is the whole reason I designed my character this way so that I would be able to summon my weapons to myself and there's no purpose for me at all anymore. And in this moment, I turned to him and I said, yes, your character is really expecting those weapons to show up. Your character is really mad right now. What does he do next? And in this moment, now that this player was able to transfer and externalize some of the challenges and the frustration and the dysregulation of himself to his character, he calmed his breath. He unclenched his fists and he said, well, um, my character is going to rip the arms off this skeleton and beat him with his own arms. And the group responded with such positivity and excitement about this great description of this moment. And I said, Yes, you do that. You overcome this challenge. You grab, you defeat that skeleton with his own arms. And this opportunity for this player to externalize the challenges that he was experiencing gave him an opportunity for insight where he was then able to, over the course of playing this game with me for the next several weeks, was able to continually practice that skill of regulation, of having that sort of externalization that provided him an opportunity for insight. And that over time helped him build that capacity to then translate that into his experience at school, his experience with his family and his experience with the community. This is such a great story, Adam. Uh, it makes me happy every time I hear it. Uh, and I love how clearly it's tied into some of those core capacities that Allison mentioned earlier, especially around kind of supporting that regulation through the use of pronouns. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about the, the data that, that uh, Adam mentioned earlier. So the goal of the current study that we're talking about today was to better understand participant and parent experiences of youth enrolled in therapeutic social skills groups at game to grow Participants and parents were asked to complete pre and post surveys about their experiences. And part of this included the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, as well as some questions about what they believed that they were working on and whether or not they found the group to be helpful. Participants were tracked across this kind of one quarter. The game to grow system works in quarters, so participants will be in a group for about uh, nine to 11 weeks, and every week they're having a weekly 90 minute group session. That group session includes a check-in, it ex includes experiential gameplay, as well as a check-out process. Additionally, there are four participants per group uh, in, in these groups. 
The parent and participant dyads were a subset of game to grow participants. So currently game to grow serves about 120 participants per week. Um, and this was a subset recruited uh, from that uh, via email. Um, it's important to note that this study was approved by the University of North Texas uh, IRB and all participants were treated with accordance to APA ethics principles. With uh, the participants who completed surveys, we had 13 participants complete post-surveys, and of those, 10 of them also completed pre-surveys. And we also saw um, parent surveys as well. So we had 24 parents complete post-surveys, and of these, 15 of them completed pre-surveys as well. So for those who completed both pre- and post-surveys, we were able to compare their results on the Strengths and Difficulties questionnaire. In terms of participant demographics, uh, participants ranged in age from 11 to 17 years old, with the mean age being about 13 years old. The participants were primarily male. Uh, we also had one female participant and one transgender participant. Finally, it's really important to, to note that half of the, the participants had been enrolled in groups for over a year at the time of this study. So that says great things about kind of the retention rate and the, the likelihood that participants are finding this, this group to be useful, but it is absolutely a confounding variable in terms of the, the research and efficacy. First, I'd like us to look at participant perceptions. So participants were asked, um, how much you agree with these statements. They were given a Likert scale that went from certainly true to certainly untrue. Uh, the, the first question they were asked was, this group helped me work on my social skills. So of participants who responded, which was 13, 100% uh, of them said that this group helped them work on their social skills, uh, at least at the somewhat or the certainly true level. Additionally, we asked a question about self-esteem. So we asked, this group helped me feel better about myself. Certainly true and somewhat true. Again, we had 100% responding in the true direction. Uh, these two questions were designed to look at participants' kind of overall view of the group, if this group is something that's helpful at all, if it's helping with that kind of self-esteem, that self-confidence piece. In addition to asking participants, we also asked parents their perception of whether or not these groups were helpful, whether or not they were specifically helpful with social skills. So for parents, we asked, um, I think, to see whether they agreed or disagreed with the statement, I think this group is helpful for my child. We saw again that 100% responding in the true direction, 100% of participants who responded said that this group was helpful for their child. We saw this a very similar trend with, I believe this, this helped, group helped my child with their social skills specifically. So this group is generally helpful and it helped with social skills. Additionally, we asked parents and participants to select items from a list of skills that they believed that they worked on or they believed their child worked on in the group. And I have put the most popular responses here. You'll notice that some of these responses look like they uh, overlap just a little bit. For example, communication and cooperation skills are absolutely a part of social skills. This was really intentional. We wanted to give people kind of as many options as possible um, because we understand that especially for our 11 to 13 year old, as well as our parents, they may have different ways of conceptualizing how this group is helpful or not helpful. Because there's very little research on therapeutic applied role playing games at this point in time, part of the goal of the study was to better understand how we might research these groups in the future. So the top reported skills included things like social skills, cooperation skills, dealing with frustration, making friends, dealing with anger, expressing emotions, and problem solving. We see a very similar list for child participants, but I want you to pay attention to a couple of things. First, you'll notice that there's nothing about problem solving that was in the very top part of this list. And you'll notice that social skills was at the top. For the participant reported skills practiced in group. So again, these are skills that they believe they practiced, they actually worked on in group. Making friends is at the very top of there. Social skills is still on this list, uh, but making friends is at the top. Some of this may be what participants believe actually happened. This may also represent some priorities um, and expectations. We can assume that participants have a better understanding of what is happening in the group in terms of what does the game look like? And what does my facilitator ask me to do? Um, and so their insights are so valuable here. The, the other piece that I asked you to look for was there was no problem solving at the top part of the parents list. It's still on that list, but it's lower down. But here, participants are reporting um, 
39% of participants are reporting that they actively worked on problem solving in groups. This may be something that's really in, that we see inherently in tabletop role playing games. There are puzzles and problems and um, sticky situations that have to be solved. So participants who are actively working on solving those, when asked to reflect on what they worked on in group, those might be things that are especially salient um, because they often come with really interesting or fun stories. In addition to asking participants uh, to kind of write on checkboxes what they found to be helpful uh, and, and looking at the group overall, we also had them fill out the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire. So the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire is a self-report as well as an observer report measure that looks at multiple domains of functioning. This includes pro-social behavior, peer relationship problems, emotional symptoms, conduct problems, hyperactivity and inattention, total difficulties, and impact of difficulties. So total difficulties is how how much distress you're experiencing across those domains and then impact is how concerned am i how much is this causing problems at home at school with friends and in leisure activities so this is very much designed to be a screener um, it's something that can be really helpful to get a little bit of a snapshot about what's going on uh, and it's a pretty short survey so we can reduce some of that survey fatigue that we can see in participants especially with our younger participants now, this is a really small sample size. Um, this is very much considered to be kind of a pilot study, but we do see a couple of, of pretty exciting things. So we did see significant differences um, in two areas on the child report, which again had um, an N of 10. There was a significant decrease in reported peer relationship problems that actually had a large effect size. Um, so that's, again, one of the things that we're mainly focusing on in the therapeutic social skills groups is focusing on um, that social engagement, that, those peer relationships. Additionally, um, with a small effect size, we saw a significant decrease in the reported impact of challenges uh, across domains. So again, we're seeing a decrease in peer relationship problems, and then we're also seeing a decrease in distress about problems broadly, uh, which is something that's really exciting. We did not see any significant differences found in the parent report at this time. Um, some of that may be due to, again, the, the small sample size. So finally, I want to talk a little bit more about limitations as well as the conclusions and future directions about this research. So this study has a small sample size uh, with individuals who self-selected to complete surveys. So it's important to continue to do this work uh, with larger sample sizes uh, across times, ideally with participants who may be new to the intervention. More than half the sample had been enrolled in the intervention for over a year. If they've been enrolled for over a year, that means they've probably completed at least 40 weekly groups, uh, which is a lot it's uh, again this is an intervention that is fun it's engaging it's something where even if you're experiencing low distress you may feel um, excited to come back because you're playing a game with friends that you've kind of developed these friendships over time um, but if we think about some of the psychotherapy literature where we start to see really diminishing returns after about 20 sessions uh, trying to look at change over time after someone has experienced 40 sessions uh, is likely to be a, a pretty big compound in our study. The conclusions that we can draw from the data today is that TRPG groups may reduce overall symptom-related distress and improve e efficacy in peer interactions for youth. Additionally, participants and parents report that TRPG groups support participants' social skills and their self-esteem, which is really exciting. In terms of those future directions, a lot of this is going back to more research. So more research with larger sample sizes, as well as identifying measures that may better map on to some of those core capacities so that we're better able to understand where we are or are not seeing change. Thank you so much for attending our portion of the talk today. If you'd like to learn more about implementing TRPGs in our practice, uh, we have a comprehensive training program for mental health professionals, and we've got another training coming up in September, as well as some on-demand trainings. Thank you so much for coming today. Hi, I'm Dr. Ryan Kelly. And I'm Dr. Megan Caudell. And today we're going to be talking about tabletop role-playing games, specifically a model mm -hmm. that Dr. Connell is going to present. Yep. And then I will be talking specifically about how evidence suggests we should design social skills uh, groups around TTRPGs based upon existing evidence-based modules to improve uh, specific Asperger's. And I'm also going to be talking about my work with uh, women and girls and those who identify as non-binary in running groups and helping them build social skills, resiliency, and self-confidence. I think it would be a really good idea to start with your model. 
yes. that you've been presenting and teaching a bunch on. Yeah, so this is a model that myself and Dr. Boca Mazzaro came up with where we have a trans theoretical model of applied tabletop role playing games. And essentially the quick of this model is it's three skill sets that when they are brought together enable you to utilize tabletop role playing games in a therapeutic way. The first set is to have a very good understanding of psychology and behavioral science and psychological interventions, which everybody at this convention should. Uh, the second is an understanding of the gaming system used. This means that you feel comfortable enough playing the role playing game that you're able to run it without having to think about it. I think of this as being much the same way that music therapists utilize mm -hmm. music. They are able to play without really thinking about what their hands are doing. They can just do that kind of subconsciously while their brain is focused more on the behavioral interventions that they're trying to achieve. And then the third point is to bring in a willingness to play, a willingness to engage with the players. That's probably one of the biggest barriers for a lot of professionals. I've actually been contacted by a few people who want to use tabletop role playing games, but aren't willing to be a part of the game. They're wanting to be more of an observer and outside influence. And so we really talk about in this model that to have this be effective, you need to be a part of the game. You want to be at the table. You want to be engaging with the players. Um, I, it was, Thinking about this, uh, I've heard a story about uh, Dr. Karen Horning when she was first working at one of the psychiatric units she uh, was a part of. She found a patient who was sitting on the floor, hunkered down as though he was like sitting in a trench or something from uh, one of the wars. And she saw that and barrel rolled into the room and came down and came up next to him pretending like she was cradling her rifle and was going, okay, who's after us? And in that moment of like bonding with him and connecting with him, she reached him where he was. And I feel like in what we're doing with the tabletop role playing games, that's really what we're talking about is like we're bonding and connecting with the, the people in our group where they are so that we can all work on this together with a shared experience. And it's when all three of those things intersect that we have that ability to <coughs> engage in change. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of clinicians probably work very hard, especially for people who don't necessarily want to be in your office, like court mandated you know, clients. <laughs> And to try to get engagement so that it can improve intervention because again we can have all the best intervention in the world but it's like that terrible joke mm -hmm. how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb just one but it has to really want to change a light bulb has to want to change <laughs> which is a reality to it my research was on trying to capitalize on special interest areas of kids with Asperger's and obviously it increases engagement so my original was with video games and using social skills mm -hmm. in a video game format which um, my research found increased social motivation, which is huge. You know, again, it's sort of there, a lot of the time we get them in our groups and so on is they, their motivation and the, their reach learned helplessness. And that led me, because there are a number of mediums that I guess I can speak to now related to the first thing Dr. Kamel was talking about is, you know, the mechanics of the game. There's a lot of mechanics of social skills groups for Aspies that are important. So video uh, modeling, is very important. So typically we might either use a video of two adults interacting, specifically doing things like furrowing their brow, providing validation to a statement, a follow-up question, having things go wrong, having things go right. Sometimes we'll do it with peers or video if consent is given with the clinician and the client um, to sort of review what happened and give these techniques. Um, so video modeling is important. Well in D&D, you typically have a group of at least four. You're watching you know, your peers, if you're not yourself doing it, you're watching your peers have interactions that are gamified and incentivized to be successful so that they can get you know, a room at the end, mm -hmm. information about the castle, whatever it is, and they're using the tools that are taught. And so the, the, the client will be watching basically live video modeling of these interactions, which is great. Uh, as well as just general role playing, which you know, which is very, very, very important. So you know, the the TTRPGs in general lend themselves mechanically to uh, efficacious social skills groups for the individuals with Aspergers. Most definitely, and one of the big things that really comes into this is building theory of mind. Yeah. And so in the 1980s, there was the big satanic panic and you know, moral panic around playing Dungeons and Dragons, and these there were some concerns of if playing a fictional character would make it more difficult to understand the difference between fantasy and reality. And so uh, Gary Allen Fine did a very big qualitative study where he watched hundreds of hours of live plays of people playing Dungeons and Dragons. And what he noted in his 1983 research study was that uh, there were three frames that happened in playing the game. So the first frame was the player, understanding I am who I am. The second frame was the game system itself, understanding the rules and the mechanics of the game. And then the third frame 
was the player, and, or sorry, the character. And if there's any blurring between those different roles, the game can't happen. It, it completely falls apart. Uh, if you want a funny example of this, there's uh, this story of called the, the Dreaded Gazebo, which the quick and dirty of this was a player didn't know what a gazebo was, and so when the game master was talking about their party came to a gazebo, this player thought it was a monster. And so they were acting in a way that was incredibly bizarre because there's no way their character would have acted that way seeing a gazebo, but because there was frame confusion essentially because the player didn't understand what was happening in the world of the game, hilarity ensued. And so in the therapeutic use, we can add a fourth frame, which is the therapeutic frame. And so we can help our clients and our players switch between these frames and have um, interesting dialogues. Like in my groups, I know my uh, players a lot of times will have sidebar conversations about how their characters are feeling about the other people's characters. Is that something that you see in your groups? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and, and as far as that fourth frame, I mean that sort of, you know, Deadpool-esque fourth wall breaking where you yeah. can come out and talk about what you're learning and what you're working on. Um, you know, I do, I mean, as you know, I do social checks where mm -hmm. it's like as, as, you know, I'm doing my stories as, or as I'm, you know, playing the non-playable character that they're having to get information out of that would then, you know, uh, you know, continue the story, um, we'll pause and kind of do these nice, mm -hmm. okay, so what do we do well there? Who, yeah. What is my mood? Everyone tell me, who can tell me what I'm feeling? Give me three emotions that I as the tavern keeper might be feeling, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then based upon those feeling, feelings, and you're right, I furrowed my brow and I'm turned, the bar of my shoulder is 45 degrees to your bar, okay? Mm -hmm. so. You're right. I'm probably not very interested. So, what are thoughts that I'm having with that kind of theory of mind? Like, let's let's perspective take. Well, you, you've identified some feelings I have. You've. What are some thoughts? And then when they have thoughts, let's predict a few actions that mm -hmm. I might be taking. So, is a likely action, and we're dealing with likelihoods. It's a likely action that I'm going to let you stay at my inn, or or be willing to accommodate you. No. No. And then it's you kind of have these things. All right. So what could what could be done to improve that? I think that's a great idea. Let's go back into the game and then mm -hmm. that scene and yep, you know, scene and you yeah. know is kind of oh, I don't know you know and it's like you know we could help you. It seems mm -hmm. like you're running out of ale. There's been drawing these pots you know like or whatever. And uh, yeah, that fourth frame is is, is very important. It's super you know. important. That's really where the magic happens. So when we're talking yeah. about the the training of how to use tabletop role playing games in theory therapy. Um, there's a lot of different folks out there who are training. I do training through Leyline Geek Therapeutics. I know mm -hmm. the folks at Game to Grow do a training. The Haunted mm -hmm. Group does training. So there, there's great people out there training and teaching you and walking you all through how to do this stuff and mm -hmm. to use these different models that are out there. Yeah, and it's it's really cool actually because at uh, Geek Therapeutics, um, uh, you know, geek therapy training, you can watch live videos of clinicians being taught how to use this, both live and YouTube videos, mm -hmm. which we could certainly provide uh, the information that we, as through our company, Geeks Like Us, will also stream and, and provide kind of like a, a, a backdoor look at it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in that fourth frame, you know, I guess, you know, I, I'd love to talk about some specific things that mm -hmm. are required for an ASPE, TTRPG, Social yeah. Skills Group. And then I'd love to know kind of when you're looking at evidence-based intervention and mm -hmm. you're big into act, of yes. how you sort yeah. of, you know, because, well, let me ask you this. I, with TTRPGs, I come from, again, the research first and then the mm -hmm. game. And that's how I got into this world. Yeah. I know you, you were a little different, actually. You liked it personally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my foray into this was I had some really big insights into myself through playing. Yeah. And I recognized that those would probably have taken years to come out in therapy um, <laughs> and likely would never have come out in therapy. And it mm -hmm. was through just weeks of playing a tabletop role-playing yeah. game, I was having okay. some really great insights into my own behaviors and interactions with things. And that was when I was like, I have to use this. I can't yeah. not use it. Well, I wonder, so here, here's the way that I construct my games and my mm -hmm. campaigns is I start with, and again, I'm, I'm almost exclusively Asperger's and ADHD for my games. Right? Yeah. I do some what are called transformational games right now, where it's just more of a social skills it's more of a friend group, really. It's not even therapeutic. It's just like, let's have a time where we can have positive social interactions and, and exposure. But um, I view it as, let me look at all the parts of, of a standard social skills intervention, intervention that evidence says works. For instance, mm -hmm. for Asperger's, we need to teach a couple things, typically. Joint attention would yeah. be one, right? Uh, the fact that I'm not just referencing something to you with my eye contact because I want it, but I want you to pay attention to it, and then I want your opinion on it, right? 
um, social referencing, um, you know, co-regulation, like there, there are, you know, a, a shared enjoyment. There are a number of key skills that are taught, key concepts are taught, that then activities must be done mm -hmm. to, to work on these type of issues of communication and reciprocity. And then I overlay the game on top, top of, of it. Yeah. So the, the bones and the meat are evidence-based interventions. Mm -hmm. And then the skin and aesthetics is let's do this through, the, you know, through mm -hmm. d and I've also known people uh, to do D and D, and then they like they throw an evidence base. Well, they throw an intervention where they can, mm -hmm. but maybe their more lo their, their metrics are more loosely focused on. I want them to have a positive experience. Yeah, which is its own thing. What and do I'm, you do? I'm a little bit more yeah between the two. You're in the so, middle. Yeah, so my groups. Uh, I have three main goals for the groups that I run. Uh, the first one is increased voice through play. So increasing assertiveness skills, speaking up, mm -hmm. learning how to use your voice and how to say, ask for what you want and to speak up and understand mm -hmm. that your voice matters and your voice is power. Uh, the second one is I want to increase positive interactions between women and girls because we know from research that women tend to be less supportive of one another than men tend to be towards women. And so I, I believe that is a very cultural thing and can be a learned behavior that can be overcome. And so trying to create mm -hmm. those opportunities to lift each other up and to see how they can help and support one another and work together. And then the third part is I do want them to have fun. I want them to have well, a good time. Well, absolutely. Because I, a if lot they're of not them, having fun. They're not going to show up. And, and they're yeah. not going to get gains. We know that. Yeah. We know they won't get, it won't be as, as efficacious. Yeah. No, I like that. And then I, I love to progress monitor, as you know. Mm -hmm. So so for mine, again, it's largely social. So I tend to do social responsive nail, uh, scale second edition. Really good measure. If, if you don't use it, I, I strongly recommend it because it breaks down social skills into different areas, including motivation, which I love to measure because that's a, a big metric of mine. And do pre post, and it's again shown to be very, very effective. Mm -hmm. So, no, that's interesting. You know, so again, you kind of got that spectrum. You got to yep. figure out where you come from. No matter what, it does have to have evidence base. Yes. But I think it's nice to have more of a, you know, it's interesting because actually Megan, a little more flexible on the mm -hmm. metrics, which is totally great. That's yeah, fine. She's great at it. But but a stickler for the campaign. This person puts so much. It's so impressive. She makes these journals with frayed edges, and it really immerses them. And we know immersion in, 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 mm -hmm. in video games and virtual reality therapy and everything is so incredibly important. So it's like oh, top ten out of ten. And I'm like super loosey goosey. I'm like, what are we doing? And I'm just improving. Yep. But my evidence side is incredibly structured. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, no, I, I think that's that kind of intervention. So we, we you know you've got the mechanics. Yep. And then that kind of goes into the third of like intervention. Yes. But, and you talked a bit about, you know, I talked special interest areas, you talked engagement. Yeah. Um, what do you do for your groups to really help with the engagement of it and really, because I imagine you have some come in who are mm -hmm. like, this feels stupid, I feel uncomfortable, this feels Lot, vulnerable, lots of should folks, I do a yeah. voice? Yeah, lots of people coming in feeling uncomfortable. So the number one thing is I lean into that third frame that, or the third part that I was talking about, yeah. the three circles of playing with your players. Right. And so I have the silly voices and I do really bad accents. And so that way they have permission to try their accents out. And we all try to just it's, be a bit silly together. And yeah. it, that works wonders. And yeah. so like I model to them what I want to see. And it's such an amazing thing to me because in the groups, it's so often the group members themselves yeah. can be lifting up and helping. And oh, absolutely. And like, you know, so a lot of it is... Uh, modeling the behavior that I want want them to see and then it's a lot of reflecting like yeah. one of the things I have my players do is <clears throat> once they create their characters we I explicitly talk about like this is a therapy group we are here to grow and to develop yep. as players yep. you know we're doing that through our character so I want to hear from each of you how you want your character to emotionally grow and change over the course of this campaign right. and to come up with their emotional a lot of agency and, and yep. their growth mm -hmm. well and I th again, for the population I'm working with, that's super duper important because right. a lot of them are coming and they feel like they don't have a voice. That uh, I've had several people in my groups who are bullied to the point that it's traumatic, mm -hmm. and they've yeah. told adults, they've told yeah. the people in their lives, and nothing happens, and so they feel like they just don't have power. And so, like one in that first point in my groups is to yeah. give them that voice, to give them that power, and to help them have that agency of change. And like I really want them to own that. And it's been really interesting because we talk about. How's your character doing on getting to their growth points? How are they growing? How are they developing? Right. What skills are they Those getting? Those little check-ins. Yeah. And then, like, <clears throat> basic behaviorism is built into the game. They hit. They help their character get through a very difficult yeah. emotional setting. They hit that emotional growth point. Their character gets a magic item. Yep. <laughs> and and that's another point. And, again, it's, it's so interesting because we, I think, we've done groups together 
we, we run very, very differently, but we actually merge. I love when we do groups together because it merges so well. And our, our, I think our strengths and weaknesses really flatter one another. Um, but, you know, for, for that kind of example where, where uh, Megs is very flexible on those things and like here's the treasure and she's really good at it. Whereas I'll use a specific system of points mm -hmm. with certain things. And, and the, to me, that, that gamification, that incentivization of using these skills for my kids is so important because honestly, you know, look, I've got young and teen boys, right? And then some college age boys where it's, it's gameplay first. They want to have fun and goof mm -hmm. off. And, and that's fine, by the way, that's, that's yeah. its own kind of gameplay. But like uh, Canal said, it's like, you know, it's here for therapy. We have to focus on our goals. So if they're going off the rails, you know, being goofballs, I mean, they can, but if, you know, you, you try to create a structure where it's like, that's not gonna do so great. Yeah. You know, if you're gonna try to dominate the tavern, you know, the innkeeper, if you're gonna try mm -hmm. to, you know, manipulate something, well, yeah. all right. But if you're empathic and you do your, another big thing is visuals. Yes. So, so I, you know, with, with Aspies, they need a lot of visuals. And, and I love flowcharts, social flowcharts. And we have a lot that we we'll use in the game. And there may be a session where we're focusing on entry level reciprocity. So mm -hmm. it's a subconscious thing we do, but it can kind of be laid out grossly in a flow chart. If I say something about my interest and someone gives a validation, oh, and then I say another thing about my interest and they give a validation, another validation point. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. But they're not asking me a follow up. Well, then in the flow chart, I've had two validations, but no, or ignore, let's say. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so now I need to ask a transition question. Do you have interest in insert the thing I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And then so, so they got to follow this flow chart, and it's basically that day in that session. It's like so th as well as you can practice this and model and everything, you know, you're, you're going to be making gains in the story, you know, like the person being like, I really appreciate you asking that. It's been a hard, hard mm -hmm. winter, you know. So and and you know, it really goes a long way. So so again, I can't express enough how beneficial this fun, interesting, yeah. collaborative you know, structure can be. And I think mm -hmm. in addition to what Megan is saying, uh, Dr. Cannell saying is something I love to do, and I know you do as a, your own variant of this, is, you know, I always love a character, have, uh, our, our players have an aspirational trait to choose. Mm -hmm. If it's a kid with ADHD, who sometimes are in my group for different functions, but similar uh, social issues, just, you know, lack of, not lack of awareness, just lack of impulse control or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, what's an aspirational trait that we want to develop that we, as a weakness of ours at the moment? And we sort of set that ideal self, you know, kind of a few things. Mm -hmm. And we try to pr practice that ideal ideal self, very CBT style. Yep. And then we sort of say, look, here's the discrepancy between where we are now and our ideal self. Mm -hmm. And as we're playing, let's see how cl much closer we're getting of our character, yeah. us getting to the point where it's feeling more and more natural to play our ideal self. And we, we've done a lot of research mm -hmm. on when when people, let's say video games, which we've done more on the D&D, &D, yeah. um, playing World of Warcraft, which is an, mm -hmm. a multi, massive multi-online player role-playing game. Um, and we've noticed that the well-being that increases the most for the players are the ones with the greatest discrepancy between current self and ideal self. Because yeah. when they can go into this world, they can practice being the person they want to be, making the value-based mm -hmm. decisions, the moral-based decisions. They leave that game feeling, I was the person I wanted to be for yeah. at least an hour. Yep. Right. Well, and, and like that's something that when I was doing my proof of concept groups yeah. just to see if it was helpful, I had one group member who was a people pleaser and would always yeah. just say yes, yes, yes to anything their yeah. friends wanted. And their friends asked them to give them a ride somewhere that they, they didn't want to go. And mm -hmm. this player was like, I felt myself about to say yes. And mm -hmm. then I thought about my D&D character. And I knew there was no way my D&D character would say yes to this. And so I did what my D&D character would do and I said no. And that's what I knew. Yeah. I was like, it's, this is it. all right. It's quite <laughs> wonderful. I mean, think about yeah. what we do with at least CBT. I know you do more act, but yep. I'm constantly talking about there's a difference between you and your brain, which is, and I sort of say sometimes the brain is kind of an idiot. It's millions of <laughs> it years is. of adaptability and 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 guided decision making, but it doesn't give us the best advice all the time. And you really are kind of having this part of you that your brain says Let's bump a little cortisol and norepinephrine because we're having a conflict. Mm -hmm but I don't have to think or act according to that neurochemical response. Yeah. And so, um, no, I actually don't have the bandwidth for that. Ooh. And then the research yeah. of that then that the brain is a feedback system mm -hmm. and that it is going to become more optimized to be a brain that naturally says no, or in the very least doesn't give a neurochemical reaction that makes you want to say yes. Exactly. I don't, you know. and, and it's just so interesting because like, Role-playing is such an important aspect of learning a new behavior, right? Pra rehearsal, right? Yeah. All therapy. Anything. Yeah. 
and it, but it feels so cheesy to be like, okay, practice going in and saying hello to these friends. And it's like, no, I, I don't want to do that. But I get them to practice doing that in with a silly voice because they are a Goliath cleric of a Storm Herald or whatever. Um, it's amazing. Like they, they will practice it all day long and just have fun and want to do it more and more and more. And yeah. so like, you know, I think one of my bottom lines is like, this is such an incredible intervention and we need more research on it and just so much more needs to be done. Because I could talk about it for hours. Like. There, there is so yeah. much applicability with how we play game, these games and acceptance and commitment therapy and moving yeah. through that. Like it's, it's a night, absolutely amazing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, obviously it's a passion of ours. And, um, you know, another thing we've touched on a bit is simply pairing both therapy and social skill development, well, really socializing and making connections with things that are positive, at least for my groups. And I know probably yeah. for yours too, it, bullying and, and social oh, isolation. Yeah. And so it's, Socialization, socialization has been, well, it's actually aversive now. Yeah. Um, you know, so so there is a difference between the mild Aspie to maybe even doesn't have quite the right diagnosis. I'll have at least one or two that come in typically with who are geeks, which automatically, yeah. and we say that endearingly, meaning they yes. have a, a passion in something that mainstream would say, oh, that's weird. Mm -hmm. right? um, they're socially anxious and they have ADHD. Uh, that profile gets Asperger's all the time, right? mm -hmm. and they still might fit in my group, but that's kind of thing. But but that group and the mild, a little different, but the 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 moderate to what we used to call high functioning autism again, you know, IQ above seventy, mm -hmm. but very low functioning socially. Um, at that point, you know, there was this research done that that HFA uh, individuals didn't care about socialization, and that that was a distinct mm -hmm. that distinguished them between Aspies. Yeah. Really what we found is they just had less and less positive outcomes, yeah. which is what a social skill is, by the way. A social skill, quite frankly, is a social interaction that has a likelihood of a positive outcome. That, that's really all it is. Um, and these people have been found to be annoying, offensive, harassers, things like that, because they're, they, they're not getting feedback of, that was good, mm -hmm. do that more, that was bad, do that less. Yeah. And so they give up. They're like, what's the point? Is that learned helplessness? So while doing this, it's it's structure, it's yep. feedback. That was really good. You know what I loved about that? I loved mm -hmm. that you know you had your you looked me right in the eye. I felt respected, and as an innkeeper, I was like, this is a person I want to keep here. Mm -hmm. I trust this person. Yeah. Right. And and they're like, oh, right. And mm -hmm. and it's done in a fun format as well, and it's kind of goofy, so it kind of you know, de-arms them a bit, yep. right? Yeah, it has that bit. way to get under all the defenses. Oh, yeah, the first one or two they can be, mm -hmm. especially with my boys. Oh, yeah, a little like, but that's the thing, is <laughs> like, it, it is just so amazing, like, because uh, I ran some Aspie boy groups for, uh, when I started, before I realized, yeah. like, that was not going to be my, <laughs> you, you handle those groups. But I had one kiddo who, in, our, I think it was our second or third game, they got to town and they wanted to do the, you know, video game thing of sell all your equipment to buy better stuff. And we stopped and we were kind of processing what their characters might be feeling. And I remember this moment of one of them going, oh, I need to do what my character wants to do, not what I want to do. I was like, ah, uh -huh. <laughs> there we go. Yes, theory of mind. All right, yes. we are doing it. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, here would be my question for you, okay? Because mm -hmm. I know, so here's something we know about Aspies that's particularly difficult that even a lot of therapists do not understand uh, to a problematic degree is that one of the toughest things is for Aspies to generalize yeah. the skills they learn, both outside of the context they learn it and like outside of the context of the social situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Dr. Temple Grandin, who would be considered more HFA back in the past, but is an Aspie, brilliant, um, you know, talked about how she struggles with abstraction like many Aspies do. If you have, she talked about a church, mm -hmm. right? The idea that if you're like, you know, what, what do you think of with a church? Well. We might think of like, you know, a triangle roof with a cross on top or, or some religious symbol and maybe some windows with color in the windows. And we're creating a, 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 a concept that we're abstracting mm -hmm. based upon many experiences we've had personally, vicariously, through media, through things we've told, etc. Dr. Temple Grandin has to go back to one church she's been to. That's church, right? The one she yeah. remembers. It had red pews and it had this and that is a church and for many aspies it's like once the pews are green not a church yep not yeah. a church so so 
with social skills, it's the same thing, right? So here would be my question. I, I know just in general, uh, social skills are tough. What do you do to try to make it so that um, the skills you teach, assertiveness, and you've yeah. spoken to it a bit, but assertiveness, competence, excuse me, confidence, self-esteem, mm -hmm. generalize to their real world and their character is yeah. existing in the real world a bit. Uh, well, there's a few things that we do. One of them is uh, doing, after there's some sort of big encounter, typically it's a, a fight scene or like some sort of big role play encounter. We pause the game and we do an after action review, which I have a former military <coughs> psychologist, so it's from the military, where we talk about what went well, what we didn't do so well, what our lessons are learned, and what things we would do going forward, what we would do differently, what we would do the same. And then I give a lot of homework of like, let's think about how can you apply anything that you learned today in your own life? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I forget who was that first gave me this advice, but like asking, what advice would your character give you? Mm -hmm. You know, when you're sitting and stuck and like you know you're supposed to do something, but you're not quite sure what. Think about like what your character. Might I've say. said that a lot. I think, I think because I've heard Adam Davis say that. A lot. Adam <laughs> Davis. Okay, I, remember, I thought it was one of the Adams. I can't remember which one. Yeah, so, yeah. Adam Davis, also a presenter. Yeah. In this <laughs> But no, and like having that ability to understand, you know, in ACT we talk about diffusion from thought. And that yeah. we can have lots of different, you know, different thoughts in our brains and we don't have to believe all of them at the same time. And so it's learning how to diffuse from one thought into maybe listen to another voice. You know, I, I talk about thinking about like an advisory panel inside of your brain. And they're saying there's a lot of different voices up there. You got your mom, you got some teachers up there, you probably have a few of your schoolhood friends. And then also, like, as you play, you start to have your characters up there, too. And, like, they're all just different advisors. And at the end of the day, you get to make the decision. But it's a way to gain more wisdom. It's a way to yeah. gain more voices and insight. No, I love that. Um, the other thing I do uh, mm -hmm. for my population is that, they, look, they all get better. Yeah. Um, but, you know, look, these things don't go away forever. We don't necessarily need them to. But, but for, for a lot of my clients, you know, the reality is they're going to get better, but they're going to they're make big mistakes. Mm -hmm. And th there's no there's no avoiding it. They're going to get banned on Discord. They're going to be banned on Twitch. They're going to do something uh, to someone, usually of someone who, who's a, a more vulnerable individual, that makes them feel like they have malintentions and are a bad person. You look at the research on Aspies who are, um, you know, uh, 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 um, what's the word, criminalized or... Uh, yeah accused of being stalkers right and they're like what right i mean it's so so it's gonna happen so something i talk about is listen we we focus on growth rather than proficiency you all have come a long way look let's look at our yeah. baseline and post and guys what did we learn and going over that but then the other discussion of there are going to be times where you enter towns and they don't like you and they seem nice and they say they're nice and they say they welcome orcs but they don't welcome orcs right yeah. They're not actually welcoming of orcs. Yeah. And they're going to judge you for being orcs, even though you are mm -hmm. and you're really trying hard and you have good intentions. And you know what? That's going to stink. But we, we can find ways to get away from those towns. And we remember that we always have our guild. We always have our team. Yep. We always have our tavern to go back to, to be like, wow, that town did not like us. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and then we go and we find a town that does. And we don't take it personally. Mm -hmm. So I think having the, teaching the resilience to, yes. listen, we're getting there. But the world is still a hard place, and mm -hmm. even the even people who are even therapists will struggle with that. And yeah. I, I do something similar, but it's a little bit more subtle with my group, yeah. which, I, which I can get away with because my uh, I usually have one or two Aspies, but not yeah. predominant. And right. they will be more of a um, they kind of bind, bond together, and like we at least we have each other, and, and like kind of they communicate your, your that tribe. Time. Yeah, they, they yeah. make their tribe. And, and that's what we speak about, right? Mm -hmm. A lot with autism is find your tribe. Yeah. I would say that applies to everybody. Most definitely. Yeah, find your tribe. But um, so that's that's kind of again we we, we love sharing uh, you know kind of Megan uh, Dr. Canell's model here and Dr. B's model, and you know talking a bit about how to apply that to mm -hmm. anxious girls and Aspies slash ADHD boys. Um, you know, we can certainly provide contact information to reach Let's us, but we, we hope this was informative and helpful, and 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 are very excited for you to listen to the other people speaking because they're all. They're all, they're all brilliant and, yeah. and they all have their own experiences which is which is awesome so thank you so much thank you